connecting to cloud server. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Freeston. I'm Director of Quality Improvement at the Early Years Alliance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Alliance webinar, look, giving you an update of the policy operational issues that will be uh, we will be facing as we move into the 22-23 academic year. I'm joined by seasoned colleagues today. Um, if you would introduce yourself, Shannon first, and then Melanie, please. Hi, I'm Shannon Pite. I'm the Communications and External Affairs Director at the Alliance. And I'm Melanie Pilcher, Quality and Standards Manager, but as a seasoned contributor, I should be <laughs> something like Baby Spice, I think. <laughs> <laughs> How seasoned do we want to be? Yes. Um, Thank you, everybody. Um, it seems from the Q&A situation that things are working now. It's good to have so many of you with us. Um, for those of you who've been with Alliance sessions before, these are very much your, uh, your sessions. We will provide an overview of a range of um, updates from DfE, Ofsted, and various other factors around. But if there are issues, questions, comments that you have of us, it is your session. Please do ask us anything you want to. We're pretty good at answering things um, in, uh, as we go through the session, but if not, we will undertake to find out answers from relative relevant colleagues uh, and get back to you. Um, by way of data protection and consent forms, um, you will have heard that this session is now being recorded. Um, by staying with the session, that means um, you are consenting to that be the case, which is why we don't have people on screen other than um, Shannon, Melanie and myself. Um, the transcript does get saved, but purely for our internal purposes to make sure that if there's any questions that we need to respond to. And we do delete the chat uh, once uh, any, any issues have been taken up. So we will, it doesn't get stored in perpetuity. Right, hopefully everybody can see that screen. This will be another hands up uh, request for everybody, please. The uh, early years update autumn 2022 with our names on it. Um, hopefully that's the case, yes? Um, please do give me some thumbs up if, if, if so, thank you. Right, let's just see if it's gonna work and move through. Has that moved with everybody? Just if you haven't got enough on screen, that's the three of us. All looking much younger then. I think we need to sort of update our photos. Less seasoned, Melanie, if you want to. <laughs> um, the aims of today's session. Uh, it's an opportunity to just lift our heads up from all the issues we've had with children coming back in into the new year, settling children, new children, new cohorts, all that that entails. To just sit back, have a cup of tea or a glass of wine, and to just think through, um, give you an update on a range of policy practice and other factors that will impact on our work as we go through this academic year. But more importantly, the opportunity for you to share your experiences and concerns as we're entering the new academic year. I think it's probably fair to say that the earliest sector in England is facing considerable headwinds um, as we move into um, this period, as are the families that we serve and the children that we serve, whether that's cost of living issues or um, whatever we will face in this autumn and winter from COVID-19 and its various variants, etc. It is, it has been a particularly challenging two or three years, um, and I think we will face considerable um, challenges moving forward. And I think one of the strengths of the sector that has been demonstrated over the last two or three years has been its resilience and its ability to share and to work together to ensure that we continue to meet the needs of the children and families who access our services. And that's the spirit with which we want to take forward this evening's session and how the Alliance will be supporting its members and the wider sector um, through the 22, 23 years. Michael, you're just fading in and out a little oh, bit on your mic. Is that, is that my microphone there? Is that better? Yeah. I'll move yes, it close to my you. ear. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, without further ado, then, I shall hand over to Shannon, please. So I get the fun, fun topic to start. So I, uh, I only have a couple of slides at the beginning of today's session, just looking at the two consultations that ran helpfully over the summer, um, partly because uh, some of the 
the proposals were kind of well publicized and others less so. So both consultations did close on the uh, on Friday the 16th, but I thought it was worth making sure that everybody was just aware what they contained. So the first consultation was the one that is tends to be referred to as the ratios consultation. So as I'm sure everybody at this uh, webinar will be aware, the main proposal in that consultation is changing the current statutory minimum staff to child ratios in earlier settings in England for two year olds from one to four to a one to five ratio to mimic what is described as the um, Scottish model by the government. Um, I could go on for the full hour about the Alliance's <laughs> views on those proposals, but you'll be aware that that is what is being proposed. Um, just to make sure that everybody's aware that there are a couple of other proposals in that consultation as well. So one of them is around the flexibility for child binders caring for sibling groups for their own children. So at the moment, and I'm going to look to, to Mel to correct me if I'm wrong on this because EYFS is her, is her domain, but at the moment the EYFS states that child minders who can demonstrate to parents, carers, Ofsted and, uh, and or their child minder agency that they can meet the individual needs of children, uh, can make exceptions to the normal ratios of maximum of three children under the age of five. If, for example, and the current EYFS says they are caring for sibling babies, or they're caring for their own baby, and there's other uh, examples. The proposal is that the word babies is replaced with children, and it's described as a clarification, not a change. Um, under all circumstances, the number of children under the age of eight being cared for still can't exceed six per adult, so that is not changing. But that is another proposal that was included in that consultation. And the other one is clarification that adequate supervision while children are eating means that children must be in sight and hearing of an adult. So that has been added in. So in the consultation document, it states that the understanding of the DfE is that everybody in the sector kind of gets that anyway, but they want to make it explicit in the EYFS. So that's another change. Um, so of course, within those proposals, the most controversial, the one that's gained the most attention is the staff to child ratios for two-year-olds in settings. I don't think it would surprise anyone to know that we at the Alliance are opposed to that proposal. Now that the consultation is closed, we're very mindful that our new Prime Minister is none other than Liz Truss, who was very pro-relaxation of ratios when she was early as Minister. And so we're very conscious that regardless of what the consultation says, there may still be a push to relax ratios in any case. So we want to make sure that in this period while consultation responses are being reviewed, we're also putting a lot of political pressure on the government to move away from these proposals. And so we at the Alliance have got a template letter for MPs. I can see that the link is embedded there, but we'll share the slides. So you'll actually have to click on the link when you get the slides. Um, and that's a template letter that allows you to add your name, your address to make sure your letter goes to your local MP and a section for you to actually put your own concerns about the changes. And we've just kind of bookended that with some stats to help help where people find that useful. Um, so we'll be encouraging over the next week or so people to start sending those letters to their MPs if they haven't already. And we've also joined up with the parenting group from the fabulously named Pregnant Then Screwed, who have an incredibly um, large reach among parents. And they have done a, a, an equivalent letter for parents that they will be promoting to try and get that parent voice out there. Um, so yeah. I could go on about ratios for a long time, but that's a kind of overview of the proposals in that place. Thank, thank you, Shannon. Ha, has there been any indication yet of the number of responses that were received? Do, do they give any feedback even of those technical aspects? Yeah, so far? Um, the suggestion we've had is that it's been a large, large response in the multiple thousands and majority parents. Um, right. which is a good sign. Um, I'm, I'm working on the assumption that the majority of parents are saying no and not yes, this is amazing. Um, that's about as far as they've gone so far. I would suggest that it's probably going to be a, a largely negative response from across the board and people are going to be opposed to it. How much that will impact the final um, decision, I don't know. But once the consultation has kind of been reviewed and the government has decided what it wants to do, it's not then that the change happens immediately. They have to change the EYFS for it to come into place. And that's a legislation change. So there is a, a process that happens afterwards and we're trying to maximize using that process 
to campaign. It's what we did last time back in 2013. The difference was then it was a coalition government. So the fact that the Lib Dems didn't support it meant it could be halted at the moment. We've yeah. got a majority conservative government that's very different, different politically. Great, thank you. Okay. I'd be interested if, um, if colleagues who were on the line um, did actually submit um, responses and, and what, how they found the process. If there's any comments on that, I'd be grateful. Um, Shannon again, funny. This is me, yep. So this is the other consultation that was kind of a bit more under the radar over the summer. And uh, if, you, if you did respond to this consultation, absolute kudos to you because it was the densest, most technical, driest <laughs> consultation. Um, so it was about the formula that defines how much money goes from central government to different local authorities in England. It did not cover how the money goes from local authorities to frontline providers. It, it, that was out of remit. It was just how you determine what this local authority gets versus this local authority. So since 2017, that's been defined by the earliest national funding formula. And again, you could do a whole web. I think we did at the time do a whole webinar <laughs> just on that. But in a really quick summary, it basically looks at how expensive is it for an early provider to operate in an area. And the more expensive it is, the more money that area should get. And that is based on how much does it cost to operate there in terms of rent and mortgage? How much does it cost to pay staff? How high are wages in the area? And what are the needs of the children in that area? So um, SEND, children speak English as an additional language, children who um, are, would be eligible for free school meals. So essentially the data that's used to define those different things has not been updated for many, many years now. So one of the proposals in that consultation was, should we update this data so it's up to date, which you would, would think would be, like, yes, please, but they obviously have to go through the, the process of actually consulting on doing that, but it feels like a bit of a no brainer. And there were a couple of other um, points in the consultation that I think it's just worth flagging up because it, it could affect how much funding each local authority will get. So one was increasing what is called the minimum funding floor for three and four year old funding for LAs. So basically it's just a set minimum funding amount for three and four year old funding that each local authority will get. It is for local authorities, not frontline providers. So at the moment, the lowest amount of fund, hourly funding for three and four year olds any local authority can get is £4.61 an hour. They're consulting on increasing that in line with rising costs, et cetera, et cetera to £4.86 an hour. And again, I stress that's for local authorities because I know there'll be people thinking, I don't get anywhere near £4.61 an hour, hang on, that makes no sense. So it is for local authorities. The other proposal, and this is in addition to, not, 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 um, it's not an or, it's an and, is a minimum funding increase of 1% for two-year-olds and three-year-old funding. So that means compared to last year, every local authority will get as a minimum an increase in funding rates of 1%, both the two-year-old and the three-year-old funding. And to be able to pay for that, they are setting what's called a gains cap, which is just a maximum limit of 4.5% for three and four year old funding and 8.6% for two year old funding. So basically what that means is for every local authority, the earliest national funding formula crunches the numbers and says, right, um, so if you say I'm, I'm Kent, so let's say in Kent, we're gonna crunch the numbers and the, the formula spits out, Kent should get, let's say four pounds 30 an hour well straight away the minimum funding floor will kick in and say well we can't get that it's too low so it needs to be at least four pound 86 then it will say well is that how much more is that than last year and if that's 0.5 percent more than last year then then it was the, the formula will say well no it needs to be at least one percent more so it will automatically adjust alternatively if that's 15% more than last year, the funding formula say, well, that's too much. We need to put a gains cap on it and it will come down. So those are the figures that they are um, proposing to set as kind of minimums and maximum limits. We did obviously respond to the consultation. And one of the points that we made is a lot of this it is important, but it is slightly re rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic in that if the amount of funding in the system is wholly insufficient, Absolutely. No matter what you do with distribution, it's not going to be enough. And the, the concept of any local authority getting a 1% increase in funding at a time when wages, inflation, energy bills, etc., are so high, 
is a little bit eye-watering. And even those local authorities on the top end getting a 4.5% increase for their three and four-year-old rates and an 8.6% increase on the two-year-old rate are still likely to be seeing a real terms loss. So the, the, the consultation is important in terms of knowing what might happen, but it doesn't answer the bigger question of how do we get more funding into the system overall? And that's something that we at the Alliance are still working on. Um, there are, and again, the link will be clickable when we set, send out the slides, the DfE has put together a big spreadsheet saying if these proposals go ahead, this is how much funding each of these local authorities will have as of April next year. So when this comes up, you can click and have a look and see what your local authority is predicted um, to get. And the last point I would make on this is that normally by early December, the local authority funding rates are published. And then over the spring term, local authorities start to consult on the provider funding rates in their local areas. And they have to be confirmed by the end of March. We at the Alliance think end of March is absolutely ridiculous for funding rates that come into effect in April. And one of the things that we've been raising to the DfE is that we feel the guidance on that should be changed. And so over, I think it's actually next week, we'll be launching a survey um, about you know when do you find out your funding rate and how soon are you consulted and do you have a chance to feedback so that we can give some hard data back to the DfE to say, not to, not to preempt the results, but if there is a problem to have some evidence-based uh, data to suggest that, that that kind of guidance isn't working at the moment. That's so, so that's astonishing. Thank you. When I looked at these slides before we started the session, I thought I'll wait until Shannon explains that because <laughs> I'm sure it does make sense. I hope that, that clearly explains it because I, I get it now. It didn't get it when it was a series of bullet points. So thank you. So this is for the 23-24 financial year, yeah? That's so correct, all of yeah. that has now got to be condensed into that period of time, is that correct? Exactly, that's correct. Wow, that's no mean feat um, moving from, from that situation. Just one other question, and I'm sorry if this puts you on the spot. Where are we on the cap level on how much local authorities are able to hold back in their distribution? Because if I recall, pre-pandemic, we were supposed to be at 98, 99 percent or something or other. I'm sorry, I should have prepped you with this before, Shannon, but if you just, it's I'm nothing to do with this. But it's 95 percent sure it's 97 percent. No, right. no, 95. It was 93 and then it moved up to 95. Right. But and again, you could do a whole thing on this. There's certain bits of funding that fall outside of that that cap so right. it's like um, contingency funding and things like that that don't get included so right. that's why and it's also an average so depending on what um if a provider doesn't get that many supplements and someone else in their set in their local authority gets lots of supplements if it averages out at 95 right. then that, that's that's what meets so not every single provider will get the 95 percent. it just needs to be an average across um, the local authority. So thank you again. Um, so my, my understanding, the two takeaways from, from this is there is still not enough money in the whole system as it stands. Mm -hmm. And secondly, what you see on these figures here that goes to the local authority in no way necessarily reflect what you're going to, what people are going to get on this webinar as the providers. So those, those perennial issues are still with us. And that's why, why we're really pushing for providers to get A, for more funding, but B, for providers to get the information about their rate a lot earlier because Fine. it's so late in the day and it makes budgeting and financial planning nearly impossible Great. for providers. Thank you. I would welcome any questions on that um, from colleagues on the webinar and I'll hand them straight over to Shannon. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, Melanie, okay, um, taking us over to the, to the side in terms of EYFS, etc. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Shannon. Um, I, even I nearly understood the funding <laughs> thing, so that must be a good explanation. So obviously now we're, we're more than 12 months in, aren't we, to the revised EYFS. There's not an awful lot to say, really, just to flag up to those of you that might not realise that there will be uh, a, a new Early Years Foundation stage for childminders. That is not because it's new as in different, just that they are going to separate out the two documents. So there will be an EYFS for childminders and an EYFS for group provision. So nothing will have changed for either of those two parties. No changes to the learning and development requirements 
and no changes to the safeguarding and welfare requirements. It's just simply where sometimes child minders have had to look through to find the bit that's relevant to them. It will now be separated out. So all the things that are still relevant to you and were before in the EYFS will still be there, but it will be addressed at you specifically. Um, Sorry, yeah, so, Melanie, can yes. I just ask, and, and I think I'm preempting a couple of questions that mm. might come in on it. Does that mean the group based EYFS will not make all of those footnote references or their explicit references in the text to childminders at all? Absolutely. There will be two separate documents completely. Right. That's our understanding at this stage, Michael. And I know the thing that people are going to ask is when is this going to happen? And I'm afraid we can't give you a definitive answer on that yet, but it, it's coming. It is coming. Okay. OK, okay. so I think that's all I can say, really, on EYFS. Just I mean, the other thing, obviously, 12 months in, I've been looking at inspection reports to see if there are any trends I can pick up on. Um, as you'd expect, Ofsted are commenting on curriculum. So obviously that, that was the, the thing that everybody was really concerned about with the revised EYFS back uh, last year. And, um, you know, there's, there's not much to say, really. As you would expect, they're commenting on how the provider organises their curriculum, how they sequence their curriculum and how everybody in the setting is aware of the curriculum and the planning for the curriculum. So that's right. it, really. That's all I can say on the EYFS. But any specific questions, I'd be happy to, to address as we go right. through. Thank you. OK, so now we come on to a few things around Ofsted. Um, again, most of you will be aware that some of these things happen just before the summer break, so it may pass some of you by. There has been a couple of updates to the guidance and the handbooks. You will know that there was a revised early years inspection handbook, which came into force on the 1st of September this year. And there were no real changes in it. Again, there was a, the major change, as, as cited here by by the DfE is there was a new section on inspecting childminders under the EIF. Um, and but again, nothing really new. They've just right. shifted a few things around, a few minor changes there, um, more specific to schools than, than to us. But a couple of things that they've clarified about notifications to Ofsted, um, how they inspect whether there are no children on roll. Um, updated COVID-19 guidance, as you'd expect, around how right. inspectors will inspect, but actually nothing, nothing new there at all. But as always, you really need to be aware of the inspection handbook, really, because as we always say, Michael, not only do Ofsted set the test in effect, they give you the answers in the handbook. So do make yourself aware of it. Um, there have also been some inspecting, uh, some minor revisions in inspecting safeguarding in early years. Again, most of those were addressed more to school age uh, provision, um, but it was done in line with keeping children safe in education, which is the non statutory guidance that we are advised will be helpful in the EYFS. So the changes that I pulled out here, which are more specific to early years. Uh, providing more information on managing low level concerns. We've already had a few questions come through to our information team about that, what that actually means, what that looks like, and reinforcing the importance of talking to parents about children's access to online sites when away from school. And we tend to think, oh, that's for the older children. But actually, when you think about it, we need to consider that in an early years context, too. And then finally, the DfE non-statutory guidance that we had, the non-statutory guidance, emergency planning and response, which was introduced in April 2022, replaced actions for early years uh, providers with regard to COVID. So just flagging that up and making you aware that uh, you are required to have a contingency or emergency plan in place. And we have put together an excellent mini guide for you, which is available on our website for anybody that needs to know what that actually looks like. But so much of our response during COVID was really about that contingency and emergency planning. And as we move forward and goodness knows what, what comes next, but it's something that we should all be doing anyway. So so that's there for you if you want to know more. Thank you.
Thank you. I mean, I think on the pandemic, it's interesting that I wonder if the virus knows that President Biden has said that it's now all over. I'm not sure quite how these things can operate, really. Um, it will be interesting to see where we go this autumn. Sorry, I'm just trying to take things on. Um, thank you both. Um, just one slide again for colleagues. I'll, I'll walk through this one. Um, the Department for Education has uh, a fund of money and a range of reco uh, pandemic re education recovery programs. Um, and I just thought it would be helpful to just give a summary slide of some of the areas of development that DfE is leading on at the moment. And you will find information about these um, about these programs and projects and support elements. Um, they're mostly available on the DfE website or uh, the Foundation GEARS website, which is now um, hosted and managed by our colleagues at NCB, is also a good location. But some of these are live links as well if you wish to find out more information. There is um, due to be rolled out, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, colleagues, sometime in, in around the autumn now, Shannon and Melanie, in terms of an online child development training portal DFE has developed. It builds on the existing Help for Early Years providers, and that is an active link um, that people will be able to search further um, outside of today's session. Focusing on areas around understanding children's learning and development, always helpful, with a particular focus in these set of modules on language development, physical development, and, and, and holistic development, which is um, an interesting approach from DFE. So look out for that. Um, information is being launched. Um, do we have any time frames? Melanie, I think you've been involved more in the conversations than I have recently on these. I think, if, Shannon, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's there's three or four that are ready to go now, and then they will gradually release the rest. So I think there are nine or ten altogether at the moment, but they right. will continue to develop new modules and release them as they go along. Yeah, I think it's 10 with the first four, and I think it was October. Fine. OK, thank you. Um, also, um, progress on the Family Hubs and Start for Life proposals. Hopefully, um, participants and colleagues are aware of the 75 local authorities who have been identified as being recipients of um, the, the pool of funding for up £300 million to deliver family services over three years. There is more detail on the hyperlink there. It's interesting that family hubs are looking as integrated services. So it's not just an education uh, initiative, it is health and social care as well. And I've just listed there some of the areas which will be focus of attention, um, infant parent mental health, parenting programs, the home learning environment and, and breastfeeding support. So they will be important um, hubs through which the parents who attend your setting could get additional support on other ranges uh, other issues in terms of supporting their child's early learning development and, and health needs as well. So, so do find out if your area is one that is earmarked for a family hub and, and how local developments are taking place on that. Some of you may be aware of uh, an initiative called the Stronger Practice Hubs, which is a programme being managed on the DfE's behalf by the National Children's Bureau. Uh, the aim is to support 18 registered PVI providers. They cannot be childminders. Uh, I'll just put that point there. They have to be a uh, group setting. Um, to lead, to act as lead hubs to support um, quality improvement of provision across their area. 18 is important because it's two per government office region is the expectation, which if you think about the size of government office regions, um, two per area is spreading things a bit thin, um, but it's a consideration of two years of the programme and the hubs will be supported with, um, uh, with initiatives from the National Children's Bureau to help them in that role. If you are interested in applying, um, the link to give you further information is the one that's there. Do it quickly. The first round finish um, submissions have to be in by midday on Friday. Um, if they if not, if they are unsuccessful in getting all 18 in this first round, there may well be um, a subsequent round um, in the autumn to try and establish and make sure the coverage is there by the end of this December. So this is moving apace. Um, if you haven't got the information already, um, do please follow it up. 
uh, either from this link when we circulate the slides or by going to the NCB Foundation Years website. Um, it's a very interesting initiative um, and one that you should find out about, even if you want, don't become a hub yourselves, but are actually interested in getting engaged with the support that will be available through the hub that is in your area. Um, I'm, and sorry, I'm just, you told me earlier, this has moved on to two slides now, isn't it? Um, the other one, uh, the level three Senko qualifications, those qualifications which are held by many practitioners, there is a project being delivered by Best Practice Network to deliver online training to an additional 5,000 uh, uh, educators across the country over the next two years. So there will be opportunities for the training to be undertaken and I think could make a real step change in terms of educators' understanding of the role and how children with additional needs are supported in our provision. Again, the link uh, to the best practice website um, is there when you receive the slide. And finally, um, the level three early years educator um, qualifications, the criteria which underpin it, have been reviewed by colleagues at NCFE CASH, who undertook the review on behalf of the DFE. Um, the, their proposals were submitted after having consultations with the sector, doing various forums with practitioners, educators and parents. Um, proposals were sent through and finalised with the DFE earlier in September, and there will be a consultation on the proposed reforms in the next stage. And I think um, colleagues on the call will be interested to know that those long running concerns that there wasn't enough in the criteria about the first year of life, uh, caring for babies and edu education and development for babies, and also more focus on what, um, support for children with additional needs and SE&D are within the proposals that have been submitted by NCFE. So watch out for the consultation so you can have a wider say in terms of how you think the proposal should be taken forward. Right. So, Michael, we had a couple of comments on the SENCO uh, yes. qualification. Carolyn said, as a maintained nursery, I did not qualify to do that SENCO ah. course. And we also had uh, someone who posted anonymously saying that it's not a lot of spaces for the level three SENCO. Um, Interesting points on the, 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 the maintained nursery issue is, is an interesting point. It's, whilst it's, I'll come on to that when we look at the SE&D review as well, but yes, it has been focused at the PVI sector. So you're absolutely right, Caroline, Caroline, sorry, um, we'll take it on from there. Um, and it's not a lot of spaces. Um, we would always like there to be more. Um, and I think get there early is, is what I would say. Uh, in that situation to try and take on the training yourselves. All of which is wrapped up within the wider green paper, which also ran in the summer on looking at the whole structure of the SCND provision across the country. So this is from ages naught to 25. Uh, basically the premise was that the changes that were brought in in 2014, um, everybody agreed with them in principle, but there were problems in the in the delivery and how the system is operating far too often, leading to an adversarial system with parents taking local authorities primarily to tribunals about not meeting statutory requirements. Uh, clearly, the situation it's recognised the situation the, the framework wasn't working, and so this is a much delayed review into trying to improve the situation and make sure we move towards a truly inclusive and collegiate approach to working with uh, supporting children with SEND. Um, the proposals to be taken forward are that there should be national standards outline what the expectations are parents can expect from for support for their children all the way from early years up to further education and a revi revision therefore as a result of the code of practice to reflect those new standards. The tensions are always between um, you create national standards, but you want them to be responsive to each individual child. Um, and we operate regional systems in this country. So how does that balance take place? And that's being worked through by DFE colleagues now. There is also, also proposals to introduce a standardised and dig, excuse me, digitised 
um, EHCP process and template, which I think will have interesting implications for early years practitioners. Um, EHCP diagnoses often happen as children move through the education system, but I think actually having a standardized approach to that could make them more a living document um, so that actually they are added to um, in partnership with parents as the children um, start to present with uh, any particular additional needs or delays. Um, there's the reference to the increasing the number of staff with accredited levels three SENCO qualification in early year settings. Um, for Carolyn's um, point, this is beyond the 5,000 within the PVI program being offered by the Best Practice Network. It's a consideration of how do we continue to expand that more as broadly for children, uh, for staff in maintained settings, uh, reception classes, etc. So it may not be the focus now of the Best Practice Network proposal, but it will be in the long-term development process for SEND. And also to explore ways to upskill early years practitioners undertaking the EYFS two-year-old progress check and encourage further join up of education and health services. We always say that. Um, we want to make the, the two-year-old check work better and be more effective. It is something that unfortunately seemed to sort of rather get lost when responsibility for health visiting um, moved from uh, Public Health England into local authorities back in 2017, Shannon? just looking i think it's something like that yeah uh, the contracts didn't necessarily move with them so it, it has rather become a patchwork if it works well in your area then um then that's great but for many practitioners it doesn't work particularly well so something in terms of bringing back to the fore the importance of the two-year-old progress check being an integrated service looking and um, with input from parents early as practitioners health social care as well would would be an absolute benefit all of that refers requires primary legislation so there will be certain elements that do not move quickly um, but there are certain initiatives that dfe colleagues are looking to do that don't require um, primary legislation and can be introduced more quickly so things will be happening even though we don't have a new um, white paper or a bill to go through parliament so it is something that um, is something that needs to be kept an eye on. The Alliance's response to the consultation built on a number of webinars and other um, sessions that we ran with the key messages being, we generally end up funding the support we offer for children with SEND either from our own pockets or not at all. Um, and the processes are too slow in as much that by the time we get either any funding or any support, the children have annoyingly grown up and have gone into school. It's this needs to take a more immediate view of the essential role that early years plays in identification of need and actually making those needs met because that's how you start parents having a good engagement with the system rather than a negative one that leads to an adversarial approach. Um, Michael, we have a, another question from an anonymous attendee saying, was the framework not working or was it just not being followed properly? Child and family was comprehensive. We already have a legal framework. Are they looking to change it and why? The general view of those who are specialists from an early years perspective, sort of from a social care perspective, was everybody agreed with the ambition and the proposals that or the framework that was created. There is an acceptance that there is not enough money to meet the demands and demands have accelerated hugely over the last five years so there is something that must be done the principles i think will remain the same the issue will be how do you make sure local authorities are meeting their responsibilities um, in an inclusive and collegiate way um, People welcomed the green paper. The, the, there have been a six and a half thousand responses to this uh, green paper, which is an unprecedented number for, for DFE consultations. Um, and so everybody is, in, is supportive of the proposals and the way going forward. The devil will be absolutely in the detail of this, of how much money is there in the system to meet these, the, the additional needs of children when actually the inflation rates for these sorts of provision are higher than is the average for our usual eight, 9% that we're facing at the moment. It is, it is 
a massive task that they're taking on to try and improve this situation. And I think underpinning it is to try and make more support available within mainstream provision, whether that's within early years, where it currently sits anyway, because there is no alternative provision in early years, um, and in schools as well. So what is becoming ordinarily available for the children and young people with additional needs is where they want to focus the activity. Hence the focus on more training for staff, for teachers, for educators, to make sure that they can meet um, the needs of children in mainstream provision, rather than it falling outside and going into specialist provision. Uh, I think, colleagues, are we? Sorry, Michael, we also just nope. had another comment as well, which was, uh, statistically, the parents won the tribunals. They seem to be making it harder for parents, and some of the proposal is legally sticky with the idea of mediators. Um, I think the figure is 98% of tribunals were won by parents. And actually, what you end up doing is the money is diverted to the tribunals rather than the provision in the first place. There's, there's got to be a break in the system to stop that. We are, it is... I think the consensus it's sort of spiraling out of control and actually something needs to happen to to change the narrative to make sure that actually the resources are there to support the children and young people in the first place rather than then having to use it to defend employment tribunals where fundamentally the demonstration is that the, the local authority will be found in breach uh, it is it is a big juggernaut to turn around i think in that one um, but yes, parents generally won. Finally, colleagues, um, something to just tell you that the Alliance is, is involved in, in partnership with the London Early Years Foundation, LEAF, um, a social enterprise chain nursery for those of you who aren't in London. They operate exclusively in the Greater London area. Bringing us back to sector views on the provision, the EYFS requirement on healthy, balanced and nutritious food and snacks where they are provided in settings or by childminders. It's a long time since we did we undertook surveys in this area so, and we felt it was important for two reasons. One is to try and get a sense of levels of understanding and confidence across the sector on how they meet this requirement, but also making it pertinent now because are there increasing concerns about the challenges of meeting this requ these requirements as the cost of raw materials, food is going up in, uh, rapidly, as are energy prices, which are in increasing as well. So are we concerned as a sector that our ability to support children with healthy, balanced and nutritious meals in the setting um, are going to be put under increased pressure, recognising Shannon's point earlier on in terms of the overall funding for provision in the sector, but also the circumstances and the impact this has on the children and their families as well uh, as the cost of living increases. So we are keen to seek your views on that. We have a provisional launch date of October the 4th, um, and we are also looking to run a series of online forums, connect sessions, um, in support of the research, just to get more in, more detailed information from people and discuss this as an issue. Um, very often we get the comments from colleagues that they have to provide good hot meals because their understanding is that that's the only one the child is getting during the day. And if those support services are being put under, under strain, then we need to have that information so that Shannon can feed that into the DFE in terms of those discussions around overall funding rates. So if it's an area of interest to you, do please let us know in the chat now or when you receive um, when you receive the, the slides and the recording. Um, just drop, drop a note back to, to Shannon, Melanie or myself because we've got our email addresses on those. Um, and we will make sure you get invited to the online sessions to share your views and experiences mm. on that matter. Carolyn's made the point that along with the cost of food, we're seeing more children with food allergies or intolerances, and these foods are expensive. It makes you wonder if that is a response of the pandemic and, and circumstances in, in the home environment. There's a whole lot to, um, to, to look into there. Carolyn, please come and join us on the online session and share that because it is something that is an increased cost. Um, thank you. And Am I right? 
Debbie has said she would definitely be interested. Smashing, Debbie. We will be in. We'll take your details if that's okay, and um, get back. Um, Shannon, I think this is yours. This is my squeezing my promo <laughs> in at the last minute. Sorry, everyone. Um, I've been supporting colleagues who are looking to promote the fact that we're looking for trustees to sit on the um, Alliance Board of Trustees to serve over the next three year period, which is March next year to Feb end of February 2026. And we are really keen. It's for Alliance members only. And you do have to have been a, a member of the Alliance for a, a year. But beyond that, whether or not you've done volunteering or been a trustee before or it'll be the first time, really want keen people that care about the early learning experiences of children and want to kind of look at what what shape do we think the sector is going to be in over the next three five ten years so there's a whole information pack on our website at that link on on the slide we've also got a short uh, web form where you could just leave your details if you kind of think you know maybe i'd be interested but i'd quite like to know quite how much time i need to give up and what it entails and if you kind of don't really want to commit to putting a nomination form in but would like to have more information if you leave your details on that web form someone will just give you a call at your convenience and have a quick chat with you so it was just as this is a, a good audience of people that are engaged and care about what's happening in the sector i thought i couldn't let it go without putting a little plug in I, I would add my add, add my request that come and help shape the direction that the alliance takes over the next three Absolutely. to five years we are a democratic organization and the trustees shape the strategic direction if you're passionate about these issues, then help us make our voices heard and, and steer the organisation. We will welcome you into it. Right. That has been a whistle stop tour of an awful lot of stuff. I realised how much we covered there. <laughs> um, I will just leave it to colleagues. I will, as I usually do, I'll just talk by way of summary to allow people to add any final questions or comments that they want to add into the chat box before we go. Um, as ever, I would like to thank Shannon and Melanie for A, keeping on top of all this stuff and also being able to present it in a way that even I understand really. Uh, so I'm delighted for that. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's typing, but my screen doesn't seem to be scrolling down, Shannon. Are you keeping on top of it? I'm this? having to manually do it. So we've right, got okay. Um, use the Harry Potter one, which is a fabulous name, just saying yes, thank you, which is very kind. <laughs> I think that's a yes, thank you. They'd like to be a trustee. Yes, yes you're Absolutely. now officially signed up. That counts as a nomination. <laughs> <laughs> and Lisa Evans saying thank you as well, which is very kind. Right. Thank you all very much. Um, it's been a pleasure as always. Um, my thanks to Shannon, to Melanie, and most of all to the participants who've joined us on this September evening. It's all about the children, the 22, 23 year. Keep focusing on how we support children and, uh, and their families to learn, develop and be solid citizens going forward. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening. Yes, um, it's my pleasure. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye bye, everyone.